And so we've made the case that the architecture of these, this chimney uh, and lens system is what we'd like to know something about for two reasons. One, because it says what the initial distribution of saturations is within the subsurface, which is this whole thing here. And the second is, uh, if we know what this distribution is, we know that once we pass fluids through here, from what we talked about last time, we should be able to say something about the velocities at which those fluids would go, water in this case, uh, the volumetric flow rates at which those would go, and actually, if we multiply merely the uh, volumetric flow rate by the solubility of this material, that immediately gives us the mass, mass rate of dissolution and its transport downstream. And so we could imagine that's an in interesting thing to know for two reasons. One, because it says maybe ha in what mass it will end up downstream at this compliance point, where we'd like to know it. And it would also say, since it's kind of a zero-sum game, whatever go ends up downstream has to be extracted from upstream. So it would also say something about the rate at which this uh, source, bless you, is changing in time and being degraded. It turns out uh, the, you know, the punchline is that the, the solubilities are maybe a few parts per million or a few tens or hundreds of parts per, per million. And so the rates at which you can move this stuff downstream and remove it are very slow. And so it persists for many decades. Uh, so that's kind of the punchline. But at least with that, uh, with what we're trying to do, we can at least say something, uh, something about that. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, we had spent some time... Yeah, okay. So, as, as in most weeks, we'll maybe spend a little bit of time recapping exactly where we think we are, and then we'll talk about our next plan, and that is that in the same way that we said that fractures are probably quite important because they're quite open, and they allow this stuff to drop through the subsurface res really easily without much capillary resistance, then permeabilities might be kind of high-speed pathways as well for fluids to travel, to water to carry things. So we'd like to say something about what the permeability of fractures might be. Um, we've talked separately about relative permeabilities last time and capillary pressure versus saturation curves. You know, in terms of physically what those means, the capillary pressure versus saturation curves say something about this architecture in the subsurface of these lenses and chimneys. And permeability versus saturation curves say something about the flow velocities that we can uh, induce through those. So those together are related. That was kind of our parting shot uh, last time, and it might be useful for us to kind of think about that. And then we'll... Uh, I thought that today we might do a flow calculation for assignment number four, which is one assignment ahead of the one that will be alive today, uh, but just to be able to illustrate these processes. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going. You'll recall that last time we finished off with this, this basic idea. And actually, we drew a, a plot together to note that these relative permeabilities, which range from 1 to 0, and they change with saturation, really just gives the transmission characteristics of the fluids in the subsurface. And so I pre-put this together, which uses this. You, you don't have this because I just put it together myself. Uh, but I'll use it to kind of explain things together. I, I just cut these two figures which are in your notes out. I don't know how well you can see them or not. But it's useful maybe to be able to zoom out to be able to see the kind of main structures of these and what they mean and to say what the key features are. And you know what the key features are. You know that both of these relationships say something relative to saturation. It can be saturation of water that's on the bottom here or the saturation of the other fluid. The other fluid could be the Dean apple. Uh, or it could be air. Denapple below the water table or air above the water table. Those are the two fluids that we're probably most interested in. Uh, and as long as we realize that one is a wetting fluid, the water, and one is a non-wetting fluid, the, uh, the napple or the air, then we can use that to our advantage because it kind of um, codifies the behavior in one, um, under one rubric so to speak. And so really what the outcome of the stuff we talked about last time was, 
is that we can define some ordinates on this. And what are these ordinates? This is capillary pressure, which is the non-wetting fluid pressure minus the wetting fluid pressure. We talked about the magnitude of this particular property here. This is what we call the bubbling pressure, PC0, or the entry pressure. Sometimes it's called the air entry pressure because it's a bubble of air that goes into the system. This is the pressure you have to apply to push it into the biggest pores. Um, maybe since it's here, I can zoom out so we can see that a bit better. This is a drainage curve, which defines the drainage of water from the system as you push in something else, air or napple. It asymptotes to some value, which is the... Who wants to tell me? Irreducible saturation of water. This is the amount of water we can't get out of the system after we've put all this air into the system. And that represents this kind of left-hand limiting value. Just marked on here. It also, by the way, is congruent with this value here, which we talked about. That's kind of our parting shot last time. And now, if we stop pushing air into the system uh, or napple into the system at these higher pressures and then back the pressure of that napple off, then we come down on a different trajectory. And we come down on this imbibition curve, meaning that water is spontaneously imbibed on a thirsty Thursday. And ultimately, as we reduce the pressures to zero, we're left with an irreducible amount of the non-wetting fluid which is left in, which would be this amount here, 15% here, of air that we can't get out of the system or napple that we can't get out of the system. So those are the important ordinates that we have on here. Right? So this is this. If we stop it partway through, uh, here, for instance, we have these scanning curves which define how we go across from a drainage curve to an inhibition curve, just identifying the hysteresis. I'm not sure we spent much time on it in the notes when we talked about it, but if you think about um, a windshield, there's this little picture in your notes. We didn't spend much time thinking about it. But if you look at a drop of rain on a windshield, you see these two contact angles. The downstream one, when it's trying to travel downstream on the windshield, and the receding one, which is this trail of water above it as it's dribbling down. So these are different magnitudes for these wetting angles, and that's really the reason for the hysteresis. The ability to wet this surface, it's more difficult when it's dry and hasn't been wetted before, and it's much easier to wet it if it's already been partially wetted in the first place. And so that's the reason that we go up one trajectory here and come down a different trajectory. Hysteresis in, in BA. But a, a physical explanation of it. So those are the ordinates of the capillary pressure curve. And if you like, these are the things that uh, control exactly what the um, this kind of chimney that we have that is smeared with a lens sitting in the bottom that sits on the, the rock. And this is 100% saturated. And this may be in the non-wetting fluid is 30% um, saturated. We can calculate that. We know how to do that. And this would be the the water table at the top. So this is controlled by capillary pressure versus saturation curves, which is this thing here, which is what you've just used on your Yucca Mountain assignment to, uh, to talk about volumes of available fluids. The rates at which we can push fluid through this when it's partially saturated, so if we know what the saturation of, these, of this system would be, say we have a capillary pressure at some location and it's equal to this saturation of water here, then we'd know uh, we could calculate the capillary pressure at this point here. We could use that capillary pressure to calculate the saturation is. And if we know what the saturation is, then we know exactly where we are on this vertical ordinate. And so the utility of that 
fluid transport behavior is as well. And so I realize that this is probably getting a bit um, hazy, uh, but this is 100% water saturated. This is 0%. It physically looks like the stuff at the bottom here. And so, for instance, if we knew exactly where we were sitting on this, at this particular saturation, we could figure out two relative permeabilities. We get the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid, which would be the air or the napple. And in this case, it's, um, I don't know, 0 0.05, just to put a number on it. And we could also get the relative permeability of the wetting, the water in the system, which is what? 0 0.25. Yeah, got it. So, that graph uh, above is basically the notion of uh, you're putting non wetting fluid into uh, wetting fluid and pushing it back, back out. We're, We're putting like yeah, non wetting fluid into wetting, into a water saturated core. And then as we drop the pressure, it gets pushed back out and it gets replaced with water. Yeah. Right. You're comparing that to on top of the board sliding down, haven't you? The reason that it comes back on a different pathway, it goes up on one pathway and comes back on a different pathway, because in this case, the non-wetting fluid is wetting, is pushing the, out the water, and in this case, it's pulling the water back in. And so, in one case, we're pushing this in against the existing wetting water, and in this case, we're pulling the water back in through the system. Well, these are different contact angles, right? These represent a different resistance. They're not symmetrical to each other. It's got this trailing thing. So it's not sitting on here like a symmetrical bubble. This back contact area here is flatter because it's already going across something that's already been wetted as opposed to something which hasn't been wetted in this particular case. And so the bottom line from this, if we wanted to calculate the flow rates through this system, so in other words if we want to calculate the rate at which water would go through this, the wetting fluid, then how do we do that? All we need to do is use Darcy's law, which says that the volumetric flow rate is going to be equal to, let's draw a diagram. Flow rate Q, an overall cross-sectional area A. It's a function of the relative permeability to water multiplied by the permeability of the core, the viscosity of water, the pressure difference with length. And I think we said last time that it's maybe easier for us to write this as everything the same, except for replacing the fact that head is equal to pressure divided by unit weight of the fluid. And this would be head versus length multiplied by rho g. So those are equivalent to each other. And so uh, to calculate that, what do we need? We know that the, the permeability of this is some magnitude. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a Darcy, 10 to the minus 12 meters squared, just a number that I'm making up. And so, but this is the permeability of the porous medium, period. doesn't matter if it's a permeability to water or to air or to Dean Apple. There's only one permeability. So we have this. This would be the viscosity of water, which is roughly 10 to the minus 3 Pascal seconds, if you remember. This would be the head gradient. And so one way of thinking about the head gradient might be the slope of the water table. Dx dh. 
which has no dimensions, which is kind of convenient. Density of water, which you all know, and gravity. So the only thing, and, and the cross-sectional areas as well we know, and the only thing we didn't talk about, which of course is, I guess, the object of what we're discussing, and that is that the value of this relative permeability would be, in this case, roughly 0 0.25, which is kind of the, the effective permeability that it, it sees, the reduction factor, if you like, that reflects the fact that flowing through this cross-sectional area, only a portion of this is available for flow of this one fluid. If it's 100% water saturated, the relative permeability to the wetting fluid would be equal to 1. If it's disconnected, then the relative permeability to the wetting fluid would be 0. And in between those, at these intermediate saturations, it would be different values, uh, between 0 and 1. And it really follows from this little figure here, if I zoom in this, this idea of the fact that at this end here, it's all water, which is the red fluid, and the green fluid, which is the non-wetting fluid, is discontinuous. So as you flow stuff across from one side to the other, you can only get across from one side to other in the red. The green is push as you might, it'll just go around it. As you change the saturation by somehow getting this other fluid in here, here both will flow, and so at this saturation there'll be a relative permeability for the non-wetting and the wetting fluids. Keep on going by putting more air or denapple in, then all of a sudden at some level the red fluid snaps off. Can't quite get that here, right? But the red fluid is not continuous, but the green fluid is. But the red fluid is still taking up some of the space in terms of the flow field. And as you keep on going, you end up being 100% saturated with green fluid and the red fluid's irrelevant. So physically, that's all it is. So the relative permeability just does it. Okay? All right. So that, that is basically a recap on what we talked about last time. So uh, we made the point before that when we dealt with flow in fractures. Well, actually, let's do this first. So let's say something about the, the geometry of this curve. We haven't really said very much about that. Why would we expect the case that this curve would actually look like this? There are a couple of features of this which maybe are important to us. The one thing we said before that the saturations of the two fluids always add up to one. So irrespective of where we are on this bottom curve, Part of the saturation will be a saturation of the wetting fluid, and the other part will be the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. Right? So each would have a different saturation. So these are the lengths. So this is 30%. This would be 70%. They have, they by definition, have to add to one. By definition, that's true, and it makes sense, right? You have a, it has to be filled with one or the other. It can't be filled with nothing. If you had a third fluid, then you could add the three fluids together, the saturations, and they would equal one. So it could be air, gasoline, and air, denapola, and water all together, and they would all three have to add to one. If we made the case, as we said before, um, we could kind of draw this little curve a little bit like this. And this is our first attempt to rationalize what these relative permeability versus saturation curves would look like. And that was this, that the relative saturations would look something like this. Yeah, I'll just use those colors. This is the saturation of wetting fluid between 0 and 1. And these are our relative permeability curves from 0 to 1. If we drew them like this, you remember the rationale for drawing them like this was exactly this figure up here. 
Not here? All right, I can't find it. I'll go here. The rationale was this. And that if we think of this as being the relative proportions of red and green, the relative saturations, then the cross-sectional areas that are filled up with each of these would just scale in this X plot on here, if that was the case. That was the rationale that we, we gave of how much cross-sectional area we had for each of these fluids to uh, fit in. And so if that was the case, then the geometries of these two uh, curves should be something like how we first drew them, in which case the relative permeability of the wetting fluid, for instance, was just equivalent to the saturation of the wetting fluid. So this is the wetting fluid, 100% saturated wetting fluid, relative permeability 1. 0% saturated the wetting fluid, relative permeability equal to 0. So this really is true for both of the fluids. So that was our rationalization of the fact that if we want to do the calculation of flow based on the full cross-sectional area that we can see in a core, and we don't really know what the relative saturations are inside there by looking at it, then we could scale the cross-sectional areas of flow roughly in terms of this saturation. And if that's the case, then we get these relationships. But this red and green curve here are not, well, I guess I drew them backwards for the color scale here, but they are not the same as these underlying curves which are here. And so the one thing is apparent, and that is that although the saturation of the wetting fluid plus the saturation of the non-wetting fluid together have to fully saturate the sample, it is not true, and you can't see it here, is that the non-wetting the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid plus the relative permeability of the wetting fluid does not equal one, right? Uh, and that's what this curve here is showing. And I'll zoom into a, a bigger figure. Go back to this, which I've kind of lost, but we'll get back to it. This here. And that is exactly this, right? So what are the reasons for that? To the fact that if we wanted to calculate exactly this curve, it doesn't look like this and this. Because each one of these obviously would add to one, right? If we wanted to calculate the relative permeability here for this point, and we wanted to calculate this permeability here to the same point, if we added those two curves together, this one and this one, because of the properties of that straight line, they have to add to one. But that's clearly not the case. Because if you add these two curves together, this dashed curve is what you get. So the question is, why does it have this particular format? And part of the rationale is that as you um, invade this system with this denapple, so this is Dean Apple going in this direction to fill the pore space that was originally filled with water, is that this will preferentially occupy the largest features first. The entry pressures are such that it'll find the biggest pore to go into. It'll fill that pore. And therefore, as it fills that pore, in the center of the pore, it will give it a larger permeability than the water would that's sitting in that same pore because of the geometry of how it occupies the pore space. I think it's maybe on the previous. And the reason for that is that we know that within the pore space, water is a wetting fluid, the red fluid in this particular case. So on the grains, it will be present on the grain boundaries, uh, but not on the interior. The other fluid, the non-wetting fluid, will fill up all the void space in the center. And so when it invades the first big pore, this non-wetting fluid will all of a sudden have the biggest flow highway which is in the system. And we don't really know it yet, but actually if you hark back to fluid mechanics, we could figure out that the volumetric flow rate is proportional to the diameter to the power 4. Um, the velocity is proportional to the diameter squared, which is um, basically a measure of the permeability.
and volumetric flow rate is equal to a velocity times an area, which is the same as a velocity times pi d squared upon 4. So velocity is proportional to d squared, and the cross-sectional area is proportional to d squared as well, right? And so this control of this larger pore in driving flow is the reason that we get this kind of um, non-symmetric geometry where at a large saturation of the non-wetting fluid, the relative permeability is much larger than it would be if the, the saturations were switched. That's really all that represents. So perhaps useful to know that. Clearly, if you add these two curves together and get this dashed curve here, they don't add up to one. And that's because they're competing with each other. Clearly, when you go to 100% water saturated, the relative permeability should be one and zero of the other fluid because there is no very little other fluid. And clearly, when you go to 100% non-wetting fluid saturated, the relative permeability of non-wetting fluid should be one and vice versa for the wetting fluid. And so the rationale of that is, is well, I don't know if it's straightforward, but at least you can rationalize it. In the same way that when we talked about relative permeability, uh, sorry, capillary pressure versus saturation curves, they had hysteresis in them. Um, you could also figure that as you change the saturations of these and replace one fluid with another and then go back over it again, then you might get hysteresis as well. And indeed, you see that. And so in exactly the same way as we had hysteresis before for, say, the uh, filling it up with um, an apple, we would go first up here in what would be a drainage curve as you drain water out of the system. And as you come back down, you go back on a different trajectory for exactly the same reasons, is that you're occupying different portions of the pore space at the same saturation. So it matters at any given saturation that you find yourself, whether you're drying or wetting. It's depends on the antecedent uh, moisture conditions, the previous moisture conditions, previous saturation. So, so that's maybe a curiosity as well. All right. So when we look at these, we could imagine that the behavior might be like these so-called so X curves. And you'll use some of these in the stuff that you do in this class. But they're not quite X curves, right? Because you know that they're And so it's very difficult to get these, these curves. They're very rarely measured. Uh, but we can figure out exactly what these curves would be just by figuring out a few points that we would know. And the few points that you could imagine that we would know is that we probably know, we could guess what the irreducible saturation of water is, which would be this. We might be able to guess what the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid, which would be this point here. And we know that when it's fully saturated with one phase, then the relative permeabilities should be equal to 1. And so if we know this point and this point and this point, then that's everything we need to be able to get uh, this green curve. And if we know this point and this point and this point, these are 100%, then we have those curves. And so although we don't 
we can imagine that this might be the structure of these curves. Not a bad approximation of those might be what we've just put together in two seconds. And we know that to an order of magnitude, this is probably 15%. This is probably 15%-ish. Just pulling numbers out, order of magnitude. And that these numbers are between 0 and 1. So with that information, you can, can draw those figures. You don't need to know this information. So. All right, good. So, so we could put those together. So that's the behavior that we might expect for porous media, which is um, what we've talked about, of sands and gravels and clays, etc. But the other thing that we made the case for is that in some media, and I'm just going to go back to, to this again, is that in the same way that you could imagine that fluids will travel very easily through fractures, so we're not talking before we talked about the entry pressures and fractures and how those vary with the size of the fracture, the aperture of the fracture. Here we're talking about the rates at which fluid can flow along those rather than whether they can invade them or not. And so if you look at the permeability of fractures, we can also calculate what those permeabilities might be in a, a fractured medium. And so one easy way to do that would be this. And also there is a rationale why you do fluid mechanics, because it relies on concepts of fluid mechanics. If you imagine flow within a parallel-sided duct, not a cross-sectional pipe, but a parallel-sided duct, then it turns out that the average velocity that you get along such a duct in the direction of flow, if you had a pressure gradient between an upstream pressure and a downstream pressure, so delta P is equal to P1 minus P2, um, then what the, the flow velocity would look like would actually be this parabolic form. It would be zero at the walls, and it would be a maximum in the middle. But since we're usually only interested in volumetric flow rates, what we could do is we could take this distribution under this parabolic curve, and we could make it into an equivalent distribution where this is the average velocity here where the, the areas under those two curves are identical, it means that the volumetric flow rate, by definition, is uh, the same. And the volumetric flow rate for flow in a duct allows us to get this average magnitude, which is this. It's a function of the aperture between the walls. It's a function of the kinematic viscosity, which is equal to the dynamic viscosity divided by the density of the flowing fluid. And it's a function of the head gradient, where we know that the head is equal to the fluid pressure divided by the unit weight of the fluid, whatever that is, water, whatever, and gravitational acceleration. And so since we know that the average flow rate could be this, then if we calculate that the volumetric flow rate, Q, which is just the average flow rate multiplied by the cross-section, bless you, multiplied by its width. So if you looked at fractures here, this might be its width. So by aperture, we mean the spacing between those uh, the two rock walls. So in other words, if you had a feeler gauge, if people know what a feeler gauge is for setting spark plugs, and points, I guess, in a car, which I guess they don't exist anymore <laughs> in a mechanical distributor. Um, but if you had a way of being able to measure the separation between this, this gap, uh, then B is that magnitude. If we multiply the average, this average velocity by the cross-section area, we end up with this. If we then figure that if you're driving down 322 and you see these limestone walls you go past, you see these arrangements of fractures that are parallel to each other, then what we could do, instead of looking at the flow rate that comes out of a single one of these fractures, we could figure out how many of these fractures we might have in a cross-sectional area, this area A, with water flowing out of the, the wall that we have. And we could use that to be able to say what the average permeability of this system is. 
And you've been using these expressions already, you just haven't uh, really been shown where they come from. Then the volumetric flow rate would be this value, because we have a total of 1 over the spacing of the number of fractures. So if you have a meter's length of this, the spacing between fractures is every 0.5 meter. Then in every meter, you'd have 1 over 0.5 fractures, which is 2. And so the number of fractures that you'd have would be contributing to this would be the component due to one fracture, which is this, multiplied through by the head drop, and multiplied through by how many fractures you have. If you only have one fracture per meter, then this is 1 over 1. If you have a spacing of 0.1 of a meter, you have 10 fractures per meter, and so you'd have 10 of these pipes contributing to flow out of this one cross-section of the area. And so the bottom line is, I don't think you need to know anything more than that, the bottom line is, is what you've used already, is that the bulk hydraulic conductivity is this, Or 12 could be 12 as well you, you probably have used 12 uh, so this would be for this geometry or the bulk permeability would be this amount this mu yeah this is this one yeah new yeah. Greek new as in viscosity it's viscosity not the good question uh, and the permeability would be actually lowercase k. This is, I guess it's my... Um, ...protocol uh, of writing permeability as lowercase k, which is units of meters squared. You can check this. This is hydraulic conductivity. This is units of velocity. But this would be just... Um, much easier. V cubed over, in this case, six times spacing. Persevering. Yes? Yeah. So the rationale is this. So this actually should be, um, yeah, okay. So this is, so the reason for this is this. So if you did it for a single set of parallel fractures, then the volumetric flow rate would be equal to, if I use this expression here, it would be, um, V cubed over 12 times spacing. Good question, by the way. Uh, multiplied by the gradient of head. This would be for fracture set one. If I did it for what this would often look like, would be a second superimposed set of fractures on here which would be also flowing out of the page at us, then this would be equal to v cubed over 12s. The gradient of head is the gradient out of the page at us. And so these things, two added together, would be 1 over 6 is equal to 1 over 12 plus 1 over 12. So we're, just, yeah. so we're just adding two together. We don't add a third because the other one's perpendicular to that. And so we're only looking at the stuff that's coming out of the page. Answer. Yeah, good question. And so, I mean, the, you'll see that I'm a bit uh, loosey-goosey with the 12s and the 6s. And part of the reason for that is I, I'm not sure that it matters that much. I mean, I think you have to think about it and defend it. But if you're looking at a parameter such as permeability that changes maybe over uh, 
know, six to ten orders of magnitude, then a factor of two in something is not a big deal. And so you might be surprised that people would say that to you, but th that's the reality. It's difficult to get a hard and fast numbers on many of these parameters. You have to go in the field or measure them in the laboratory. They have a large, a reasonable amount of variability to them. And so that variability compared to the 10 order of magnitude is, is perhaps not a, a large magnitude. Okay. And so, the, so these things, remember that when they're stated here, um, you've probably used them so far as uh, 1 over 12, but, and that's the reason that we just mentioned. Don't forget that it matters as to whether it's hydraulic conductivity or permeability. The re relationships are different. And so in the same way that we could use this to calculate um, permeability of something, uh, just to, to walk back a ways, the volumetric flow rate out of a pipe is proportional to um, the diameter of that pipe to the power of 4, as we said before. And so all we've done now is used a different shaped conduit as a capri model to be able to say something about what the, the permeability should be for this, and that would be this value. And then by extension, uh, if you take that on trust, we could make the same analysis that we do when we look at uh, relative permeabilities of porous media. And that is that in a fracture, I don't know if I have a picture drawn somewhere. I thought I did have a picture drawn somewhere, but maybe not here. No, not here. We've used it earlier on. If you imagine a fracture as being not a parallel plate, but being kind of a rough-walled, uh, two rock walls kind of in contact, then you can imagine that if you start filling this up, and what's the pore space going to look like? So if you take water, which is this red fluid, and you start to saturate it, I guess you'd put a monolayer of water all the way across here, and that would be present just like on the grains of a porous medium. That would be what would cover the, the fracture walls. If you kept on adding water, so in other words, if you started off at this saturation here and started increasing the amount of saturation of water, what would you expect? I suppose you'd expect it that it would go close to these little necking points and start filling here first. the green stuff here being the, the white, I suppose. And as you keep on adding water, you would slowly start filling in these portions. Like this. And so in the same way that when we think about a porous medium, there'd be some big pores and some small pores in these tubes that we think of. The big pores saturate first. Then in a fracture, you could imagine idealizing this fracture as some um, I'll just draw it on one side so I don't have to do it both. You can imagine representing this fracture by something like this, where you have big pores. I haven't drawn it very well, but this would be good. Some big pores that ultimately neck down maybe to, to zero size. And in the same way that these little uh, apertures have some distribution, it's just the same as the pore size distribution you have in a fracture. And so if that's the case, then you could imagine that within a fracture, you'd also have these relative permeability curves, which we, again, don't know how to draw very well. But at a, a pinch, you could imagine that we might draw them like this. Because we just don't know what they look like. But we do know that this might be 15%. This might be 15%, this is 1, and this is 0. And so we could imagine that we could actually construct those if we wanted to. So there's a bit of arm waving going on here, but the reality is those things are rarely, rarely measured. Uh, but we know what they look like, and you can usually get a pretty good idea of what's going on just by looking at their general shape. Okay? All right. Um, what else do you want to talk about? All right. Everyone okay with that? I don't know how much detail we want to do this in, but this is also worth making the point, uh, I think. So to close this off, and I suppose working from this, so both fractures and porous media 
we can think of as a collection of these different pore sizes. We can think of those pore sizes as a whole bunch of capillary tubes that have different uh, diameters to them. And we note two things. One is that the entry pressures into those capillary tubes is controlled by linear function of their diameters, uh, because we know that the entry pressure, the pressure we have to push a bubble in is proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the aperture. What was it for a, a capillary? It was um, capillary pressure was equal to 4 sigma over diameter. So we know that. We know also, so that defines whether we can push this other fluid into the system or not. The other behavior we have is how quickly this stuff moves along it if it's fully saturated with this one fluid. And we know what that is for a fracture, which is this magnitude here. We haven't uh, developed an explicit relationship for it for a, a porous medium. So this is fracture. And I'm just going to be in the margin, I'm going to do it for a porous medium. And so we know that these are potentially the permeability of a single fracture or for a collection of fractures. So this is the geometry we just drew. For this. We can also think of a porous medium as a collection of a whole bunch of capillaries. And if we do that, it turns out that the permeability is something like um, the porosity times the diameter of those capillaries divided by 96. Take it on trust. Well, could derive it, but I bet you'd prefer to take it on trust. So this is the diameter of these capillaries. And so there, these, these are exactly the equivalent to each other for a porous medium or a fracture. This is the entry pressure for a, a fracture. So you remember what we did, what was it? We put two plates in a fluid and we looked at how high up in this plate this thing rose. And this HC was equal to this value here, 2 sigma over V times gamma delta. <coughs> this was just the aperture. So at least we've used consistent terminology. The aperture is still B. And so this says something about the entry pressures, how much fluid pressure you have to push to first invade the porous medium. This says that 100% saturation of that given fluid, this is how quickly it runs, because we know we can use that to get fluid velocity is equal to permeability, viscosity, um, pressure gradient, which is the same as permeability, viscosity, head gradient, multiplied by rho g. These are exactly equivalent to each other. One's written in terms of pressures, one's written in terms of heads. So these say something about how quickly it goes. This says whether it can invade in the first place. One reason, I su not, not I suppose, one reason to do this for these two different um, media, fractures and porous media, is that what we can also do is we can actually link these together. If you take, if you actually believe me that this is true, what we could do is we could 
figure out what the behaviors were in terms of this common geometry. And the common geometry is that each one of these, we have a pore that has some diameter to it. So we could arrange this equation as in terms of the diameter. And that would be something like permeability times 96 <coughs> divided by porosity, square root. So I'm just rearranging that in terms of um, the diameter. And we could rearrange this in terms of diameter is equal to 4 times interfacial tension over capillary pressure. So that may seem like kind of a futile thing to do, but what we could do, and I'm going to run out of space, is if we just take these and equate them to each other. What do we end up getting? I'm going to make myself some room. If we do that, we end up with 4 times interfacial tension divided by capillary pressure is equal to square root of permeability of a porosity and square root of 96. And so what we could then do, if you wanted to, is we could then just rearrange that <coughs> in terms of, state it in terms of capillary pressure. So let's just rearrange that same expression, and I'm going to take... Um, <coughs> So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to keep this here, and I'm going to take everything else onto the, the, the right-hand side. You'll miss the punchline, man. <laughs> Me too. I'm out of here. That's all right. <laughs> so this is so all we've done is we've written permeability in terms of the component diameter. We've written the ability to invade fluid into the thing in terms of its component diameter. So they're kind of consistent in a mechanistic way with two different processes. They are two different processes. And just by combining them, we have this expression here. And this expression actually is kind of cool. Because if we now look at this, and if I was to draw you this figure here, Hopefully you'd recognize this. This is saturation of water, right? Between uh, zero and hundred percent. This is not. This could be capillary pressure, but it could also be the J function, which is equal to capillary pressure divided through by uh, interfacial tension and multiplied through by square root of permeability and porosity. That's exactly what you have. And so physically, this is the pressure that we have to apply to physically push the first bubble into that one pore diameter, which is the largest pore diameter, which represents the permeability. And that magnitude is this. And so this is about, well, I can't do this, but this is about 0 0.4, right? Square root of 100 is 10, divided by 4 is 0 0.4. And so this is saying this, exactly this. And so it's not quite on, but this is the analysis that's done. This is uh, 0 0.4. We've used something closer to 0 0.3, which is really what it is. But that's, that's where that idea comes from. So the idea is, if you represent the physical processes that are going on in terms of these very simple models, one is the capillary tube, you're trying to push a bubble along, you know the resistance to that bubble is provided by interfacial tension. Uh, the other one is that you're trying to push fluid along a capillary tube to represent your porous medium, and along that tube you have this geometry where at the edges of the capillary tube the velocity is zero, and at the middle it's a maximum, this parabolic distribution that we looked at kind of here. We said this is in a, a fracture, but you have exactly the same parabolic distribution in the cross-section of a tube. If we use those very simple um, mechanistic models, then we get something 
very real out of it, which is an explanation of why this magic number of 0.3 comes out of this. It's slightly larger, but it's basically the same same idea. So, so I think that's cool. You may not think it's cool, but I think it's cool uh, in tying these things together. What else do you want to talk about? Um, okay, so we can use this in a useful way. So what we've um, not said anything. So we've looked at these two very dif different behaviors. One is the invasion behavior, which is our first few weeks, capillary pressure versus saturation curve, so first few periods. We've looked at this flow behavior, which is Darcy's law. Uh, I don't think that there's very much, historically there's been very much use in me making this big case for what we now do. But what we do is, uh, the reason that we talk about conservation of mass and Reynolds transport theorem and things like that in fluid mechanics is that those are the principles that end up being used to take these behavioral laws, Darcy's law is a relationship between pressure gradient and the velocity you get, and capillary pressure is a law that says you have to apply this much pressure to get it to invade into the system, and we use it in an, uh, some appropriate conservation laws. And the conservation laws are written out here in kind of um, differential form. Again, I, I don't think it's, it serves much purpose to go in through this in excruciating detail, other than to say that there are two terms. One term that says something that is volume in minus volume out, which is this, is equal to accumulation. And it's just a mass balance. And so I should probably say what these terms are. This is the density. This is a porosity. Typically, that stays the same. But what might change is saturation. So if you think that the pore space stays the same, but you fill that pore space with water instead of air, then if you do the mass balance on water, then you're getting an accumulation of water if you start filling that space with air. And so what, that's what this accumulation term would, then, would relate to. This does conservation on density. So in other words, if you wanted to, you could just put density outside each of these expressions instead of inside them. And so it is a mass balance. This term says that what you put in and what doesn't come out the other side of the differential cube is the accumulation. Nothing more than that. And so what we can do is we can write these behaviors in terms of a, a particular behavior. Now. This is a, a velocity. This is what we've called velocity, which is also equal to permeability over viscosity times a change in pressure. This is Darcy's law. I'll never examine you on this, by the way. don't think it's useful for us here. So if we can use Darcy's law to substitute in here, we get something that's a function of pressure. If we can define saturation, as a function of pressure, as we know we can, so do it pictorially rather than anything else, right? We know that as we change the capillary pressure, we change the saturation. And so we can say something about the saturation of this. Then what we could do is we could try and write a set of equations that define our system. And so those sets of equations would be these four equations down below. And so we can write a mass balance For phase one, which is water. I hesitated because I was looking at this. So this is capillary pressure of the non-wetting minus pressure of the wetting. So this P1 has to be water. Just definition. We have mass balance 
of phase two. Which is the non wetting, which could be, I guess, generally the NAPL or air in our system. And again, this is just the mass balance equation that has Darcy's law put in for this term here. And so you'll see this this is permeability and relative permeability altogether, pressure gradients, etc. And so if we have two equate the two equations basically say we have a bucket, uh, we have stuff going in, maybe some coming out, what doesn't come out that goes in accumulates. And so that's this first term here that changes the relative saturation of that term, of that fluid. And the rates at which stuff goes in or out is controlled by the pressure. And so the, the variables that define this equation are the pressure in the water, the pressure in the napple, the saturation in the water, and the saturation in the napple. So all quantities that we've talked about so far. So that's fine. That describes our system, but that's two equations and we have four unknowns. And so we have to figure out exactly how to get two more equations. So one equation is that we know that if we add the two saturations together, it always has to equal one, which we've said a number of times. So this is a third equation. And the final equation we can use is that we can use this relationship of the differences between the pressures in the two fluids we have to always be along this curve of capping pressure. Yep. Uh, which one? one? Here? This is a function of. Function of, yeah. And so this is a function of pressures one and two. This is a function of saturations. We now have four variables, which are these four variables here. And we have four equations, so, so we can solve it. So that's really all we need to say about that for this class anyway. Plenty, plenty complicated enough. And so if there are solutions of these sets of equations, the most famous ones are also the namesake of uh, Leverett, Buckley-Leverett equations, and the Leverett J function. The J function was also named for for Leverett, same person. And um, I'm not going to go through the, these expressions, but I will look at what the ramifications, I guess, are for that. And so this, this would be the idea. So what you could do, you could take an aquifer or reservoir. And what you could do within this reservoir, if this is the reservoir here, between these two aquacludes above and below, you could pump in some water at some flow rate. And since these were developed originally for petroleum, it's a petroleum reservoir into which water is pumped to get to push the petroleum out or oil out from the system. And if you looked at the uh, change in saturation as you go along the length of this reservoir, so this would be this length x. <coughs> this could be saturation along here. And we're not going to worry about the mech, how we would solve it. Then the behavior would look something like this. So if you take this lower figure and you imagine this vertical ordinate here being the x-axis, this is exactly this here, and this being the saturation here, then this is the behavior that you'd expect that we'd like to be able to figure out. So what do we know about the, the system? So this is uh, term shall I use? This is the origin, if you like. This is where Q is being pumped in. 
this is this point here. And this is the distribution of saturations along here. So it looks like uh, the initial saturation is one that starts off um, with this. So what would be the original saturation? The original saturation would be this, right? I wish I could draw a dashed curve, but I can't. This would be the initial saturation. So you have an oil reservoir. It's got as much oil as it can take, and the rest of the space, 15% maybe, is filled with water. That would be a good case, right? And so the initial saturation is that there's the irreducible saturation of water here. This is 100% saturated with water, which it isn't. And so this amount here would be oil. This, well, red's this. This amount here would be the initial water amount, all the way along here. Not physically, it's distributed within the pore space, right? So it's not centrifuged out, so you have a layer of water and a layer of oil, but it's distributed in some way. And you pump in some water. What's going to happen? You're going to pump in some water. It's going to be a high enough pressure that you raise the saturation from this amount here all the way to here at the injection point. And slowly this slug, at a, if you look at a time step, this would be what the new saturation would be. This would be invaded with water, like a tongue of water going through it. Everything behind here would be the saturation of the other fluid. As you keep on pumping water in, then it would start to look like this. So now the part that's invaded by water would be this. And I guess this would go up here. So that if you chose to look at any particular length along your reservoir, here for instance, it would be the same saturation all the way across, and that would represent, say, this position here. And so at any given time, there's only one of these curves, so this has to be the saturation of the relative components. This would be the saturation of the non-wetting part. This would be the saturation of water, and so, on. so And we can calculate that. I guess that's the only message, is that if we know what these behaviors are, so we have a continuity equation, says mass in equals mass out, and the difference between those is accumulation. We do that for oil, we do that for water, and we have these two other rules in terms of the saturations always adding to one, and the capillary pressure curves, like this, always being honored then we can come up with an equation to tell us exactly how the saturation will uh, vary along this aquifer if we were to try to do that. And that's okay. Uh, it could be useful for us to do that. But I guess the other thing that you'll always realize here, of course, is that as you go along this aquifer, even once you get as much water into this system as you can possibly get, What's the maximum saturation going to be in this reservoir or aquifer? Right? It can't be any more than this magnitude. This magnitude would be this amount of water, and it would be this amount of the non-wetting fluid. And if we know that is something like 15%, then you can always calculate at this residual saturation how much of this other fluid you have in there. And if you can't get it out by just pumping and treating it uh, in any way, then you're going to have to do something else to do it. And so even though we've kind of really only talk, touched on the surface of this, we already know some very significant lessons about this, and that is that probably pump and treat can never work for us unless we pump and treat forever and try and dissolve this stuff out, because we certainly can't displace it by any fluid mechanical uh, measure. So that's useful for us to know. We're, we're right up against time. Do I want to say anything to close out? I'm trying to think what the different components were that we talked about. Uh, we know, yeah, well, we kind of know that as well, right, from what we said early. Uh, because if we look at the, the different saturations that we have, even when we talked...
the first time we met, uh, we talked about this funicular saturation. And this behavior here is how this would look. This would be what the oil would look like, which would be little bubbles. And as much white water that you put through here, you're only going to pull water out the other side, nothing else. 